you have your like atomic clock. Yeah. Cause this one is not uh, precise. This one? Yeah. Better than one in the Cornell seminar room. <laughs> Isn't that off by like five minutes? The only reason the one at Cornell is not precise is because we wanted Nima to finish early. So we put it 15 minutes ahead. <laughs> True story. Okay. Tell us again about uh, flavor. flavor physics. Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope everybody is uh, ready and awake. I know it's so early in the morning. So. <coughs> Yesterday we talked about, we got some uh, <coughs> introduction and then I make one important point. Anybody remember what was the point I was trying to make? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yes, someone, someone brave, you have to be really brave. Nice, thank you. Yes, <laughs> yes, so we make the point that nature is not generic and therefore the standard model is not generic and we have some, <coughs> some structure that uh, we have there. And <coughs> Actually, in the beginning of the lecture, we went through this little table, and I hope that by now, when I tell you, oh, a B meson, everybody remember their core contents. And then we actually went through the exercise of looking through some decay rates, and we made the following observations. We say it's kind of interesting that we have lepton universality. We talked a little bit about what does it mean. Then we said it's kind of interesting that we have some structure that <coughs> 2 to 2 transition are much bigger than 2 to 1, and 3 to 2 are much bigger than 3 to 1. And we made the point that flavor changing charge currents, the rates of those processes are much bigger than flavor changing neutral current. And from this, we make the point that the standard model is not generic. And then we went through a little bit of the exercise of uh, model building. And we got into a little bit of uh, politics, democratic versus uh, <coughs> other kind of uh, ways to do things. And we say that. When we do physics, the idea is that we have, you write the Lagrangian, it is the most general that you can write, and you do the truncation. You remember we talked about the truncation and this fact, and then toward the end of the lecture yesterday, we end up with, actually that's where we end up. <laughs> so nobody erased it, that's really nice. So we kind of say, take an example of a model, and we took a model that works called the standard model, and we write the gauge group. We so what are the fields that we have, the Q-del field, and then we say we have to write the more general Lagrangian up to some dimension, and we choose up to dimension 4, and we had some discussion why we choose dimension 4, and at the very end of the lecture last time I said, wow, when you have something that you can write up to dimension 4, you can always write those four terms, and the four terms are the kinetic terms that involve all the kinetic terms and the gauge interaction, and when we do ph phenomenology, what we really care about is the gauge interaction that come from here. And most of the, inter not most, but very important parts of the interaction come from here. And <laughs> we make the fact that we size only uh, masses for the fermions, and there's no mass fermion masses in the standard model. And this is the Higgs potential. Let me make it nicer. <laughs> That's the Higgs potential, the fact that it involves only scalars. That's the one that gives us spontaneous symmetry breaking that is not part of this lecture. And then we have the Yukawa interaction that involves the coupling of the Higgs to the fermions, and that's where we have neutrino masses and basically all of the flavor come from the, inter, from the <coughs> intermix between the kinetic term and the Yukawa interaction. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's what we did yesterday. Any question? Maybe like during the night you have some dreams. <laughs> yes. So you said that um, you have a left-hand number violation above dimension four, so dimension five. Right? Yes, the dimension five left-hand number is violated. So you said the only dimension five operator is uh, neutrino mass. That's right. So the neutrino mass is violated left-hand number. Yes, exactly. And it's the one that's the Majorana mass, right? So it's Majorana mass. Of course, you could write a Dirac mass, but that's not the dimension five operator. So the dimension five operator that you write. After the Higgs requires the VEV, it gives you neutrino masses, and that's actually one that, <coughs> that breaks all lepton numbers. Yeah, but you, you know, there's two, the two things, there's lepton number, total lepton number, and, e and family lepton numbers. Okay, and it actually breaks all of them. Okay, so, I, so when we talk about the neutrino as double beta decay, we care more about the total lepton number. And what I had in mind is actually all three of them. And, that's, and I really hope that I will get to this dimension five later in the course. <coughs> okay, so if there's no more questions, let me move on and start for the lecture for today. 
So we write this uh, Lagrangian of the standard model, and when we write a Lagrangian and we truncate, a very important result is that any Lagrangian that is truncated has a finite number of parameters. Okay? And that's very important. And then philosophically, how do we do physics? We say, if we have a finite number of parameters, and anybody know how many parameters we have at the classical level of the standard model? 18. Extremely important number, actually. You know that in now <laughs> coming to the holy city of Jerusalem, the number 18. Anybody? Yes? So for our visitors, 18 is an extremely important number in the Jewish tradition because in the Jewish tradition, each letter has a numerical value, and 18 has to, is equivalent to life. Okay, and that's why everywhere in the Jewish tradition you find this number 18. Okay? So it doesn't support the standard model. It's totally correct. It must be <laughs> the right number. Okay, and then you go to the quantum level and you find the 19th parameters and everything <laughs> breaks down. <laughs> right? <laughs> but then, you know, so the, the other very important uh, numbers in the Jewish tradition beside 18 is, anybody? Is of course 26, which is the... When you actually take the explicit name of God and you add up the letters of God, is 26, okay? And then, so this is known for thousands of years in the Jewish tradition. And then, uh, about 50 years ago, when they discovered string theory, how many dimensions? <laughs> 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 okay, so, you know, so these two facts totally quite that string theory and the star must be the correct and the Jewish rabbis knew it 2,000 years ago. <laughs> but, uh, <coughs> anyway, so the, it has 18 parameters. Yes? But does, uh, the difference is 8. Does 8 correspond uh, in the you know, connection between 26 and 18? Uh, <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so I, I don't think that 8 is, but then it's come actually really important. So, you, you, yeah, you're a formal guy. So what's happened, this is, was the bosonic string. When they found the heterotic, whatever, how many dimensions it works when you, when you include supersymmetry? Eleven. Eleven is the M theory. Exactly. M theory, but... Uh, yeah. ten. ten. Okay, and everybody knows that the other name of God is just <laughs> this one letter. <laughs> this one letter is just the letter Yud, which is actually ten. Okay, so, I mean, it, there's very deep things that actually used to be a series of conferences. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> the connection between the Kabbalah and string theory. I know there were at least three of those. <laughs> I never went, but anyway. So <laughs> you have 18 parameters of the standard model. And <clears throat> let me just kind of do a show of hand. How many of you know how to count? I mean, how to count until 18? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, <laughs> how to count the parameters? How, if I give you a model and I said, how many physical parameters I have in this model? How many, know, how many of you know? Everybody who read my book knows, yes. <laughs> Not all of you, okay? Um, <clears throat> okay, so I might uh, get a little bit into how you do this counting, but not now. Now I'm just telling you that this model has 18 parameters, okay? So when I have a model with 18 parameters, philosophically, what do I need to do in order to start doing physics, okay? I have to make 18 measurements. And in those 18 measurements, I measure the 18 parameters. And then from the 19th measurement on, I can start making prediction. Okay? That's the most general thing that I can do in any, any, physical, any, <coughs> any physical theory that I have. I must first make a number of measurements that equal to the number of parameters in my theory. And only then I can make prediction. The subsets. Mm -hmm. And then you can do have subsets. And this subset is like the big picture of... Um, Physics is an approximation, okay? So you can say at tree level, I can also do a subset. But eventually, at the quantum level, all 18 parameters must enter into anything that you measure. But you are totally right that you can actually, if I care about some precision, I can actually make a subset of measurements, right? So that's totally correct, okay? And <coughs> for example, we all know the famous one that if I take this and I can calculate this because I was TAing. Um, what I was doing last semester? <laughs> okay. Uh, freshman mechanics for engineers, right? So you know this uh, formula that uh, x is equal to gt squared over 2. My so how do we know g? Okay. So usually we Google <laughs> the value of g. And actually for most engineers, g is equal to 10 to make life easy. And actually, yes, they use uh, meters and seconds, this kind of units. I mean, okay. But how do they know that this is equal to 10? Okay. 
you have to make a measurement. So you make my one measurement, and in this measurement you measure the value of G, and then you can use the value of G that I measure in the first measurement to make prediction for all the other objects that will fall, right? Because in this theory of, of gravity, you have one parameter. So in the standard model, what I need to do, I need to make 18 measurements, and after I do this 18 measurements, I can start making prediction. That's point clear? Yeah, but I thought you were going to tell us why 18, how do you deduce the 18 and not 19? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the, the 19, I'm definitely not going to talk that's a quantum effect, and I'm really not going to... That's not what I was, I was saying, like, why... Why 18? we have 18? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, should we do it? Uh, okay, let's, let's count to 18, okay? So the way you count to 18 is as following. You start with one. <laughs> then you, uh, so I, I will get, I, let, let me explain it. But let me finish one little point and then I, I'll, I'll teach you how to count to 18 because if you've never seen it, it's kind of cool. Okay? <coughs> so what I want to make is the following uh, point. Okay? We can distinguish for any model that we have, we can distinguish between a generic model, which is, if I think about the standard model, is a generic model which have 18 parameters that I don't know the value of those parameters, okay? For that one, uh, where is the eraser? It's here. Uh, so, let's, so I want to make this big distinguish between a standard model versus the standard model, okay? And what is the big difference between these two things? A standard model is my Lagrangian without the values of a parameter, okay? The standard model is the one that we actually see in our nature with the given 18 values of my parameters, okay? You see the difference? If I, again, coming back to this example of a falling, I said, any planet would have this theory of a free fall that has a constant acceleration, right? Only the Earth have the one with the value of whatever, 9.8, or, you know, of course, it depends where you are exactly. Yes? So you see the difference, okay? This, the theory of free fall will also be valid on the Moon, but on the Moon, the value of G is something like 1.7 or whatever it is. Anybody remember? A six. A six. One over six, roughly. Okay, so it's a <coughs> roughly pi squared over 6, right? So, you see the difference between those two things, a standard model and the standard model? And what I want to, when we start talking about the different thing that we saw in, the, in, <coughs> in nature, I want to make it very clear what some of those properties are generic in any standard model. So, no matter what are the value of the parameters, some of these properties are there. And some of these properties are there only because of the very specific values of the parameter that we see in nature that are specific to the standard model, okay? So not only yesterday that I was telling you the standard model is kind of uh, far from generic, we also find that not only that a standard model is far from generic, the one that we see in our nature is in, in a way more delicate because some of the properties are very specific for the value of the parameters that we have in our nature. Good? Okay, so I, I, I really wanted to emphasize this point, and <coughs> let, me, let me go five minutes and explain how we count to 18, and then we come back to what I wanted to do, okay? So, <coughs> the way we do counting, I want to <coughs> give you the following example, and then, we'll and, and then we generalize it, okay? And the following example is, is as following. Let's say that uh, I have a hydrogen atom and I put it in a magnetic field. All of you did it in quantum mechanics, right? When you put it in the magnetic field, I, I was not in your quantum mechanics course. Maybe the only one I was was with Yonit because I was teaching it. But all the rest of you, I was not in your quantum mechanics course. In which direction the B field was pointing? All of you? <laughs> really? Nobody like X direction? <laughs> really? Z direction? Like why? Why did we choose the, the magnetic field in the Z direction? Because of Wikipedia, <laughs> that's right. Why did we choose it? So <laughs> let me go through the little exercise 
and I want to do the following thing. I said, I don't care. I want to put the magnetic field in an arbitrary direction. Arbitrary direction. It's have an X, Y, and Z component. Okay? Now it's totally everything is lost because then you learn, you get the Zeeman effect, ta ta ta. You remember the Zeeman splitting? Okay, so the Zeeman splitting goes something like delta E, scale like something like mu B, right? Mu B Z, right? Something like this. Yes, it's correct? Nice. Okay. <laughs> so, <coughs> what happened now if actually my magnetic field is in an arbitrary direction? Can anybody tell me how I modify this equation if my B field is in an arbitrary direction? Nice. No, so actually it is the magnitude because I only care about the spectrum. I don't care about the way I, I make the measurement. So yes, I was I have to be okay. right. So how do you do this? Okay, how do you actually do this kind of little interesting thing? So what we did is the following thing. So when you learn quantum mechanics. You say, I have only one new parameter. My result depends only on one parameter. It's the magnitude of the, B, of the B field, which is busy, right? But then there's actually three parameters. I tell you, I, I introduce three new parameters. When I put my hydrogen atom into the magnetic field, and I put three new parameters. I put Bx, By, and Bz, right? I introduce three more parameters. And then it's turned out that actually, I only care about the magnitude of, of this, OK? Or another, another way is to say, I can always choose the z direction to be the direction of the b field, and then bz is the magnitude of b, right? So what is really going on here? I have three new parameters. So I, when I turn on the magnetic field, I introduce three new parameters to the theory. But actually, only one of these parameters is physical, and two of them is unphysical. In, a, in the following way, that I can always do a rotation and choose the z direction to be the direction of the b field, so I can always find a system where bx and by is zero, right? So in this sense, they are not physical, yes, because I can always make them zero. Make sense? Yes? So I introduce three new parameters, but out of these three new parameters, only one of them is physical. You are with me? Okay. And <coughs> now let me actually discuss how I can really make it unphysical. So now, let's make the standard uh, thing that's x, y, and z, right? z is going up, okay? So now let's choose my a magnetic field in an arbitrary direction. So how I make this is into, to be the z direction? I make two rotations, right? I first make a rotation of this into the, <coughs> say, y, z plane, and then I make another rotation into the z direction. Have you seen it? I really, I really like to make rotations like this. I, let's do it bigger, rotate like this. <laughs> That's really cool. You see, I did two rotations, and these two rotations, I eliminate two of those uh, things. You okay with me? So now let's go a little bit uh, theoretical, and let's talk about symmetries. That's right. But then you see it's like helping the bank. <laughs> so I don't want to do this. <laughs> so you're totally right that I can always, when I have one vector, but if I want to rotate my whole system, I need two rotations, right? It's the usual story with the Euler angles, right? So you're totally right that if I have one vector, I can always find one rotation that I do. But <laughs> the point is, if I want to rotate the whole system, the point is as following. What was the symmetry before I put the magnetic field? What was the symmetry of the hydrogen atom? What was the symmetry? SO3, it was rotation in real space. After I put my magnetic field, what was the symmetry that survived? SO2 in which direction? In which plane? In the orthogonal plane to the Z, right? So in terms of symmetry, what's happening? When I introduce the Z field, I, I have SO3 going down to SO2. Introducing the magnetic field, I explicitly break my SO3 down to SO2. Okay? How many generators SO3 has? How many generators? I hope I'm, when I say generators, we're all with me, yes? How many generators SO3 has? How many generators SO2 has? How many broken generators? What does it mean to have a broken generator? What is the difference between a good generator and a broken one? 
A good generator is one that when I apply it, nothing happened. A broken generator is actually so much more useful than an unbroken one. Because a broken generator, when I, do so, when I apply it, something really happened to my Lagrangian. Right? So I can actually, I use the broken generators to eliminate my parameters. That's what I did. Right? So I said I have only one generator that is do nothing, but I, have, I can do two that actually do something for me. So I start here, and I use my broken generator to eliminate by, and then I use my broken generator to eliminate bx. Okay? So the point is that the number of parameters that ca I can eliminate is equal to the number of broken generators. That's, I hope, that's actually the most important part of this little counting trick. Okay? The number of broken generators equal to the number of parameters that I can eliminate. Are you with me? Yep. Some of you. So how do I know if you are with me or not? It has to do with the amplitude of your <laughs> head. <laughs> right? If the amplitude is very small, <laughs> okay, and also the frequency. That's the idea. Maybe. <laughs> Okay, and then if I go in the other direction, that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I hope you are with me. And if not, go a little after that, you can actually kind of convince yourself. But that's the point. The point is that the number of unphysical parameters equal to the number of the, unbroke, of the broken generator that I have when I introduce something new. So I introduce something new, and I have the number of broken generators. Okay? How this has anything to do with the standard model and counting to 18? Okay? So I want to think about the Yukawa interaction is the same as adding a magnetic field to the hydrogen atom. So I think about my theory only with kinetic terms, okay? And then it has a very large symmetry. And when I introduce the... Yes? So actually, it must be the same, right? Yes, that's why I'm asking both. In one sense, there is a broken symmetry with broken generator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I, uh, here, it's I'm, I'm definitely not talking about spontane symmetry breaking. Because spontane symmetry breaking, we know it doesn't break the symmetry. Here, what I talk is about, I have my leading order Hamiltonian or Lagrangian, and the higher order terms break a symmetry, just like in the hydrogen atom. My leading order Hamiltonian have an SO3. The magnetic field is an extra term that breaks it explicitly. So here is the same. My kinetic terms have a symmetry, and the Yukawa interaction, think about them as a perturbation. And when I add this perturbation, I break uh, the symmetry, okay? So let's take a, a simple example, <coughs> okay? Like in the standard model, what would be the symmetry of <coughs> my kinetic term? So let's, uh, let's take a, a, a kinetic term of my U right field. So my U right field, my kinetic term is U R I, oops, what? D slash U R I, right? I equal 1, 2, 3. That's the kinetic term of the UR field. What is the symmetry of this term? Okay? So the symmetry of this term is the so-called U3 symmetry. It's a U3 symmetry because basically <coughs> I can rotate any component of any of the U to any direction. So that's just, if you think about UR is a vector in a complex field, okay? And a general rotation in a complex three-dimensional field is a U3. And U3 is, is, a, is not a simple group, it's actually SU3 equals CU1, and SU3 equals CU1, how many generators it has? Nine. 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 So that's eight plus one, that's nine generators. Okay? So this is the symmetry of my kinetic term. Now when I put the Yukawa interaction in, okay, I actually, I'm breaking the symmetry, because then each component have a different uh, direction, and I don't have this symmetry anymore, okay? And actually, when I put everything into the standard model at the end of the day, what you find out that the only symmetry that survives is the accidental symmetry of baryon number, okay? So then let's just look at the quark sector. So in the quark sector, I have three kinetic terms. I have this one. I have the same one for the D, D I, D slash D. And I have the same one for Q bar, D slash Q, okay? So my... Symmetry, before I put the Yukawa interaction in, my symmetry, I have 27 generators, because I have 9 plus 9 plus 9. I have 27 generators. You are with me? Okay. So I start with 27 generators, and they broke down to U1 by your number, so they broke down to 1. So I have 26 broken generators. 
So it can eliminate 26 unphysical parameters. Okay? Now we look at the Yukawa interaction. And the Yukawa interaction. So all I care about now is the flavor symmetries. Okay? okay? And actually, I don't. <laughs> that's the one that is broken by the. the you know. Yeah, the the <laughs> so let's look at the. <coughs> Yukawa interaction. So the Yukawa interaction is Q bar YU Q bar phi tilde U plus <coughs> YD Q bar phi D. And let's put an indexing IJ, 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 IJ. Okay? So how many parameters do I introduce, just like when I put the magnetic field? How many parameters I have here in YU? 18. Uh, this number come again to hunt us all the time. Why 18? 3 times 3 times 2, because that's the, fact, the prime factorial of, uh, of 18, right? But why 3 times 3 times 2? Because it's a generic, it's, the most, it's a generic matrix, it's a 3 by 3 generic matrix, and it's a complex matrix. So a generic 3 by 3 matrix, which is complex, have 18 parameters. Yes? So I have 18 of this and 18 of this, so I have a total of 36 parameters. Yes? So I have 36 Yukawa, Yukawa parameters. So out of these 36 Yukawa parameters, I know that I can eliminate 26 out of them. Okay? So that's give me down to this amazing number of 10. <laughs> Why it's always those interesting numbers. Okay? You, you, do you know the theory that all the numbers are interesting? <laughs> yes? <laughs> I don't... Yes, it's a really cool proof, okay? My son, you or the, you or the other one? He, he, he taught me this proof. It's a really cool proof, okay? It's, co it's a proof by contradiction, okay? Let's assume that there exists an uninteresting number, okay? So then, actually, you, <coughs> you start from, uh, and we only talk about natural numbers. So if there exists an unnatural number, there exists the smallest uninteresting number, okay? And let's make it interesting, right? So therefore, all numbers are interesting. <laughs> yes, I love this proof. OK, so we come down to 10. So we have 10 physical parameters in the Yukawa sector. Were you with me on this counting? Where did the 27 come from? So the 27 come from the fact that I have three kinetic terms. OK? Each of them is a U3. So I have a U3 of the U right. I have a U3 for the D right. And I have a U3 for the Q left. OK? So each of them is a U3. It says three times, so it's three times three, that's giving me the 27. Okay, and I down to bio number, so that's 26, so I have a total of 10 physical Yukawa. Okay, so now let's see how we get the 18. So I have 10 Yukawa. When you do the same calculation in the lepton sector, in the lepton sector I have only one Yukawa. So I have only 18 uh, uh, total Yukawa, but the broken, I have u1 cubed is the lepton number that is unbroken, so I, it gave me 3 in the lepton sector. So in the lepton sector, I have 3 Yukawa. Yes? And then I have 5 more parameters that come from the other sectors of the model. I have the 3 coupling constant, g, g prime, and g sub s, and I have the 2 coupling of the uh, Higgs sector. Oh, you can write them lambda of v or lambda nu square, okay? But these five are nothing to do with our counting, okay? These are from the other sector of the model, okay? So then you add it up, 10 plus 3 plus 3 plus 2 is equal 18, okay? So the 18 parameters of the standard model are given like this. So the last part was not um, very symmetry related? No, so this one actually does not know, you know. It, it, so this one is, is the trivial thing. I just, if, if you write a, a, a gauge interaction, so if you have SU3 cross SU2 cross U1, you must involve three coupling constant, okay? You write the more general Higgs potential and you find that you have two parameters. Here there's nothing. The, the kind of the interesting counting comes from how many Yukawa interaction do we have, okay? And then actually you, you keep going and you ask how you actually parameter this Yukawa. So what are these three parameters, this Yukawa, how can we measure them? So there are three physical parameters in the lepton Yukawa sector. Okay? They all correspond to which physical parameters? What are the things that we measure to actually get those three? 
the masses, the lepton masses. So these are, they correspond to the mass of the electron, the mass of the mu, and the mass of the tau. And this, the 10 u cow of the quark sectors, which they correspond to which physical parameters? So we have six masses, six masses, and then we have three CKM and one phase. We're going to talk about it in, a, in more details, clearly, because it's a flavor course. So I definitely want to talk. But now I'm just kind of putting it down to you. Okay? So <coughs> we kind of, I was very brief on this, but we kind of briefly understand how we do the counting. And actually, if you ever want to count, maybe you heard about the MSSM 124. Yes? So why it's called the MSSM 124? Because it has 124 parameters. And if you want to know how to actually count to this 124, you do the same exercise that I did here. It's just much more complicated, it's just a little longer. Okay? And then when you include some upright evaluation, you get the MSSM 357. Okay? And which is the same story. Okay? But at least you know how to do it. It's the same story. It's, it's this fact that you use the broken generator to eliminate unphysical parameters. <coughs> okay? Yes? Hmm? <coughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I already make the point that I only talk about the classical level. Okay? When things become in the quantum level with the theta, theta QCD, it's become more complicated. I mean, but actually, this, this counting is correct. It's just we have one extra parameter. So in general, you need to have experiments also to measure the U1 charges of the particles. Uh, because this is also some kind of parameter. So yes, so you must measure, so I must have, so you mean, I must measure G and G prime and G sub S. That's what no, you mean? Also like the oh, very, very, very. No, 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 no. So, so the point is as following. When I define the model, this is a number that I put in as an input, right? So I define my field with a given U1 electric, U1 charge. So this is not something I need to measure. It's part of my theory. Of course, you want to verify that your theory is correct. But what I want to say philosophically, you have a theory. You have to make 18 measurements to measure your 18 parameters, okay, within your theory. Okay, you and only, only then you can... Exactly, yes. And actually, I want to be here a little more precise. And that's something that helped me dramatically to understand the whole story of renormalizability and all those kind of things, okay? Actually, parameters are never physical. There are some intermediate steps in our calculation. And you see what I was telling you, and you all agree with me. In order to actually have a model, I have to make 18 measurements to measure the value of the parameters, and then I can make prediction, okay? So you see that I never actually have to measure the value of the parameters. All I need to do is to get the result of 18 measurements, and then from the result of these 18 measurements, I can actually start making prediction. And I don't really have to go through the step of saying, measuring the, the value of the parameter, okay? And <clears throat> when you do classical physics, introducing the value of the parameter is a very useful concept, okay? So a very useful concept is to define the value of G. But you see that philosophically, I don't need to define the value of G. I can do something like this. I said, all I need to do is to know that the pen drop one meter in whatever, some value of seconds, okay? This information is enough to predict that anything else, okay, actually in this case it's trivial because anything else will take the same time, okay? But you see that I should, ne I actually I don't have to introduce the value of G. All I need to do is I have to take two experiments and plug the result of one experiment into the other and eliminate the value of the parameter. So parameters are never physical, okay? And why it's helped so much in the, all this issue of renormalizability because in renormalizability, you get all those stupid infinities and you start to worry, and say, oh, what does it mean that you have infinity? And the answer is that, of course, because you take something that is unphysical, so why, why are you worried that you get infinity? Okay? The thing that are physical is one measurement versus the other. And when you think about renormalizability, and you think about, oh, how do I actually renormalize cross-section? So I say, oh, how do I know my original alpha from one measurement? And then I know the... All I know is how to relate the value of alpha from one measurement to another. There's no bare alpha. Bare alpha is totally unphysical. The only thing that I have are physical measurements. Okay? So I hope it helps you. It definitely helps me to understand the whole idea of renormalizability when I think there's 
parameters are totally unphysical. Yes. So, so, the, so the way I like to think about it, I like to think about it, <coughs> I can think about the, you know, the, the, the particle have a mass, but what I'm really doing is that I actually I have a result of a measurement. How do I do the measurement? So I take actually a, an electron and I put it in some oil drop and etc. That's how I measure the mass of the electron. So what I really have is an experiment, and this experiment gives me an output, and I interpret this output as the mass of the electron. And when I talk about things that are classical, this is very, very useful. When I go to quantum mechanics and talk about RGE, it becomes less useful. It's totally fine to use it. But philosophically, for me, parameters are unphysical. All the things that are physical are just experiment. Yes. Yes, so, so then the, the way we are doing model building is that we say, I put the value in some explicit scale, right? So I said, I put the value of uh, my parameters to be this value at the gut scale, right? So I said, at the gut scale, the Yukawa coupling of the bottom is equal to the Yukawa coupling of the tau. That will be a model building statement. And I, I give it a number. And then, you know, we understand everything. But I said, uh, in, in terms of running coupling constant and all this. But the whole idea of running coupling constant and all this become very easy for me to understand when I realize that it's all totally mathematical, okay? F parameters are not physical. They are just a mathematical tool that help us to do calculations. The physics is that you make 18 measurements and then you can make prediction. That's the physics. You never had to go through the definition of parameters. Yes? But, but we can measure the masses of the light quarks, right? That's, that's another example of why this is like kind of a when the, the problem of measuring mass is, you say, I want to measure the mass of the U quark. And you say, oh, how can I do it? Because it's, it's bounded. And if it's bounded, I can never measure it. Okay, so what is the answer that I like to give? I like to say the answer, of course, because this is unphysical. So why are you worried? It's totally unreal. What you can measure is you can, you can measure whatever, some cross-section that you do in some deep inelastic scattering, or you can measure some, and then you interpret this as the mass of the U quark. But is it a mass of the U quark in the same way that I said there's the mass of this plane? No, it's not. But there's a U quark, it's one of the parameters. Yeah, that's right. So it's the U quark, is the, yeah, so. And then, is this U quark, does it have a value at low energy? The answer is no, I cannot even talk about it. But I don't need to talk about it. Okay? All I need to do, philosophically, is to make one measurement and use the result of this one measurement and plug it into another measurement. And then I can make prediction. Okay? So why are you saying that they are unphysical? Because, uh, because all parameters are unphysical. Parameters are mathematical tools. Okay? What is physical is just experimental result. All the thing that is physical is an experimental result. The value of G is unphysical. What is physical is the measurement that I did, that how long it takes for a pen to fall. And then I can interpret this number of how long it takes the pen to fall. I can interpret it as the value of G. Okay. But G is not physical in that sense. So the mass of the up is not physical. The mass of the top is not physical. The mass of the tau is unphysical. It's just a result of the measurement that I interpret this measurement as a mass of a quark. But what I really have is a measurement. There's no fundamental value. It's not some God-given value of G. So you should not say those 18 parameters are physical? All I say philosophically, but you know, we are doing physics, so it's very practical to call them physical, so it's okay. Most of the time. But when we say physical, we should be able to measure, not, so not in terms of the masses, but something else. That's right. So, so then, you know, you have to kind of understand how you, how you interpret your experimental result in terms of what you call the value of the parameters. And then we introduce running coupling constant. And the first time that you introduce running coupling constant, it sounds, um, I have a name, oxymoron. It's a constant, a constant that change. Wow! <laughs> okay, constant can change because a constant is by definition something that doesn't change. So if you say a constant that is change, it's an oxymoron, right? So how can you talk about running coupling constant if they are constant? They cannot run. They cannot change. But then you say, well, that's what I mean actually by all those definitions.
okay? Yes. Oxy? It's a Greek word? Ah, thank you. You know, I really need you to teach me how to say right the, <laughs> all the letters. How you say n n the neutrino? Nu, ni? Netrino. Ne? Netrino. Ne. Yeah. But the letter, the letter, the letter. This is me. Me. But you, you, you. <laughs> See? See? Nee, me? Wait. New is me? F mini? <laughs> it's amazing, amazing. Okay. <coughs> okay. <coughs> okay, let's let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> Of course, yeah, of course, but the CKM values also runs, right? So what do I mean when I tell you that VCB is equal to 0.4, at what scale do I talk about it, right? So it's always those complications, and I'm, I'm really not going to, I mean, we can talk much more about it later, but I just want to make the point that, phys that philosophically parameters are an intermediate state, an intermediate stage in our understanding, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but in general, okay, like uh, you talk about the running government, uh, this is the Wilsonian picture, let's say. Yeah. It says that you have some symmetry that it should be considered as you go from the UV to the IR. This is what makes a parameter physical. What, this is what makes something physical, which is something that it is uh, in uh, unchanged under uh, symmetry. So. so So only, only if something is RG invariant, then it doesn't change, right? But all I want to say is the following. All I want to say is that philosophically, the way we do physics is as following. You have my Lagrangian. I make N, and this Lagrangian is described by N parameters. Then I make N measurements, and I use the output of those N measurements to make prediction. And this, the, the, the step of taking the N measurements and make prediction goes through the, the definition of the parameters and RG, and you name it. But the philosophy is that I make n measurements and I use the output of those n measurements to make predictions. Okay? So I don't need to define parameters in principle. Okay, so let me move to, let, let me go on. So we define the standard model, we actually count the number of parameters. We kind of very briefly wrote the Yukawa interaction, I assumed you've seen it before, and we wrote it all. And <coughs> then we go through the exercise of spontaneous symmetry breaking which again I'm not going to talk about because I assume you saw it and this is the flavor physics and the spontaneous symmetry breaking this phi uh, acquires the VEV and then when this phi acquires the VEV I get masses and all this and I'm going to get into a little bit of the details now just so we're going to see it but I want to <coughs> make the following point and that's an actually a very important point the standard model explains everything So there's, there's, there's two reasons why some people are, you know, it's not really laughing. It's not like this laughing like, like you know, when there's a good joke. It's laughing more like, nah, it doesn't really explain everything. The stand model explains almost everything. <laughs> okay, now everybody is happy. The standard model explains almost everything. There's a few little things that it doesn't explain. Maybe a few sigma, you know, we still have, we still need dark matter. So that's why... Hmm? Only 95% of the universe. You know, you, you are, you know, this is like, I, 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 you know, people sometimes, all they care about is quantity. Quantity, yes, this stupid dark matter, it's like this one stupid thing that just, so many of them. But, uh, but you see, the electron, you know how important the electron is, and it's hardly, a, but can you live without the electron? <laughs> okay, it's only 10 to the minus of the mass of the, yes. So, yes, so, okay, so we cannot explain 95%, but still we explain basically, Everything. So dark matter, yes, okay. Gravity, okay. 
<laughs> no, we can explain classical gravity. Okay. Oh, the hierarchy problem actually. Not a problem. It's not. <laughs> so, so, so this is a philosophical question. No, no, this is a philosophical question. Within the framework that I gave to you, there's not a problem. I measure 18 parameters and I'm done. Oh, that is because you yeah. have to, to, to specify the size of the master and the lambda part of the pole in order to have SSD. And this is not given? Because we don't know why, why it should be the master. Totally, totally. That's the whole philosophy. The whole philosophy is that I have to make 18 measurements. One of these 18 measurements is actually a very easy measurement to measure the sign of mu squared. And... I can do it right now. Let me measure the sign of, of mu squared. Uh, is, the, is this massive? Yes, massive. Mu squared is negative. Right? Yes. <laughs> and I know I'm a theorist, but still, it was very convincing, right? So <laughs> So, you know, so again, so I want to emphasize that I wanted to be very clear about the way I set it up, and I set it up in this way that I say, I write the most general Lagrangian, I truncate, and then I make the, the, the measurement of the parameters, and I don't ask why those numbers are as following. Actually, I, I will discuss it. I will discuss it. But this is not something that the standard model doesn't explain. Okay? So yeah, the standard model, actually, gravity is totally fine. The only problem with gravity is that theoretically we cannot have quantum gravity, but experimentally, there's no experiment. So far, there's no experiment that the standard model could not explain, okay? And if you talk about dark matter, it's all these problems, it's what's going up in the sky. On Earth, we explain everything, okay? Is it okay? <laughs> <laughs> Anything here on this room that we cannot explain? I totally, I can explain the it. The model does not talk about gravity, even classical gravity. I, I don't mind giving, you know, I don't mind. You are. You, you just say it, but I, like I could not agree with it. In, in low energies, you can quantize gravity. In quantum field, you don't. I mean, you can, but that's not the standard model, right? Okay. When you write okay. the parameter, you okay. can't write large G, right? <sighs> I don't mind. You can go on. I was silent. <laughs> 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 thank you, Itai. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're right. Okay, let me be more precise. The standard model explains all the PDG. <laughs> <laughs> Good? It's a big book. It's a really big book. <laughs> okay? The standard model explains all the PDG. Ah? <laughs> finally, finally you agree with me. You know, it's very easy to negotiate with me. I change it. And just, okay? So here, the standard model explains everything. Let me, let me change it. It's time to explain the PDG. I'm, that's what I do. It's time to explain everything. Maybe let's say everything is the PDG. <laughs> everything <laughs> is the PDG. Okay. You see? I changed. PDG. Okay, good. So now I can move on. Okay? So actually, it is far from a trivial statement. That the fact that the standard model explained the PDG in the following sense. That we have 18 parameters. Okay? And the PDG has more than 1,000 measurements, okay? Much more than 1,000 measurements. We have huge number of measurements, much, much, much bigger than the number of parameters, and each measurement that we are doing is another test of our theory. So the standard model is actually a really amazing theory. Yes? What about neutrino masses? Yes, it cannot explain neutrino masses. <laughs> totally right. And it's actually <laughs> in the field. <laughs> 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 Okay. No, no, okay, okay, okay. The standard model plus dimension 5 <laughs> explain everything in the PDG. <laughs> That's your problem that you know how to calculate. It's not the standard model problem. <laughs> right? So all we are saying is that, you know, <laughs> we, the fact that we don't know how to calculate doesn't mean that it doesn't explain. It's just that we seeing that if we knew how to calculate, it would have explained it. And neutrino mass is totally right, and that's what we talked, hopefully, is the dimension 5 that we already mentioned. Okay? But what I want, the point I want to, to make is really the fact that it's far from a trivial statement. And one thing that we got used to it is, oh, the standard model, yeah, of course, it works. Okay? About half a year ago, 
they measure the first time they measure CP violation in charm. How many of you heard about the measurement of CP violation in charm? <coughs> nice. Almost half of you. Okay? First time that they measure CP violation in the up sector. Okay, half a year ago, more than five sigma. And it basically agrees with the standard model. I'm gonna, I, I really hope to spend like a good chunk of like half an hour to explain it. Okay? There was basically three papers came out. One that me and Stefan wrote. We were so excited. Two other groups. And that's it. The world was like... I got a phone call from Physics Today. Oh, shit, I should have remembered. From one of these, uh, you know, a journal that go for the general public. And she said, so they measure CP violation in charm. Do you think it's interesting? I said, oh, it's, it's so amazingly interesting. I said, but why nobody cares? I said, I don't know. But I mean, <laughs> because it's standard model. And it says, oh, yeah, of course, you know, the standard model. Uh, yeah. I mean, when I look at people who do biology, okay, they have this uh, theory of evolution. Every time they find something that agrees with evolution, it's like, wow, evolution works. It's so nice. <laughs> wow, evolution works. And for physicists, ah, it's standard model, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and all my friends ask where, where they are. You know, when George come in, ask him, what do you think about the standard model? Ah, it works. It's amazing. We have a theory that explains basically <laughs> all the PDG by neutrino math. Okay, it's still amazing. <laughs> right? It's really, really amazing. The standard model is an amazing theory. Okay? It explains so, so, so much. So much of nature. Okay? And I think that, you know, you are, uh, you know, still young, and I don't, I don't want you to get this feeling that the rest of our field giving to us, that we already have the standard model. It's a, it's a done deal. Okay, it's an amazing thing. We actually, we as, a, as, as humans, as physicists, were able to find a theory that basically explained all those subatomic interactions within a very, very simple model. You know, it was like, you know, half a blackboard, and that's it, and we explain everything. Okay? <coughs> so, I made my point. You remember, yes. The standard model explained everything according to my definition of everything, which is the PDG but neutrino mass. <laughs> okay. So, if the standard model explains everything, one way to ask is the following. Okay. Do we, should we go beyond it? And the answer is, of course, everything is an approximation. Physics is the art of approximation. We have to go beyond it. So we ask the following question. Just the fact that we explain everything, what can we say about the thing that we neglected? Okay? Or another way to say it is as following. I can write my, let's write it like this. Let's write standard model 4, which is up to dimension 4. And then I add dimension 5 and dimension 6, etc. Right? Since the, so far the standard model explained basically everything, this one, I don't need it. Or another way to say it, I know that the coupling of this one is very small. And how small it is, I can put a bound on the coupling of these higher dimension operators based on the precision that I can get from experiment and from theory on the standard model. Okay? So I can do a very precise measurement of the mass of the W and the Z. And by making a very precise measurement of the W and the Z, I can actually put bound on the dimension 6 operators. Okay? And I can, make the, I can look for proton decay, and I don't see the proton to decay. And because I don't see the proton to decay, I can put some bound on some other dimension 6 operator. Okay? And the way we like to do it is as following. We like to write, let's, let's consider dimension 6 operator. And I can write some dimension 6 operator, let's say that is something like this. Some psi by psi, psi by psi, with some Dirac structure in the middle and some flavor indices. And this is the dimension 6 operator. So I write it like this. I write my operator like this. And I assume here there should be some uh, number. And I assume that this number is 1 in the sense that this lambda over, <laughs> this small lambda over capital lambda squared, I just forget about this small lambda, and I parameterize the value of the parameters in front of this operator just by this uh, dimension minus 2 uh, constant. You okay with me? Okay, so I don't write this uh, value. I just write this 
Okay? So then we say a, a way to say how good our model works is how good of a bound I put on the scale of the higher dimension operators. The higher the bound is, I know that my theory is, is more precise. Make sense? So now I'm asking the, the following questions. If I look at dimension 6 operator, and I was is the bound of this lambda. So let me ask you, anybody knows roughly, order of magnitude wise, what is the value of this lambda? So lambda has to be larger than some number. Because for very small value of lambda, that means that this operator is large, and that I know that will violate the standard model. So the fact that the standard model basically works, tell me that this lambda has to be larger than some value. Anybody know what is this value? Roughly. Specifically for the case of neutron uh, interaction, neutron neutron interaction, I think it's about 0 0.01 and something like that. Specifically for the spin interaction of neutron. <laughs> <laughs> GV. What? Oh, you mean like if I exclude the. GV, GV. 10 to. 10 to the 15, I think. No, uh, 10 to the 8, 17, sorry. Something like that. 15, 17, let's do 16. <laughs> okay. 10 to the 16. So it I go for 10 to the 16. For a specific structure, I assume different structures are probably a lot less bounded, right? Oh, for the ones that are most easily available. Okay, so it I go for 10 to the 16. <laughs> okay, <laughs> anybody else? Anybody wants to give me another number? So I, I really, really like the fact. So let's do the following. Here is a star. Specific number. Specific. <coughs> so we remember I don't claim anything. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so the, so the point is, let, let me emphasize the difference between the scale of the operators versus the scale that we do the experiment, okay? So there are two different scales, okay? One scale, really the scale that we do the experiment, and if we do the scale at the, at the LHC, the energy scale of the LHC is whatever, TV, roughly. And if we do flavor physics, the scale is the mass of the B, which is like 5 GeV, okay? But that's the energy that we do the experiment. Here what I'm talking about, I talk about the theoretical expansion in terms of operators, and this is the scale that comes together with, this, with the operator. Because it's a dimension 6 operator, the coefficient has dimension minus 2. So I write it as 1 over lambda squared. That's just the value of the, pro of the coefficient that has nothing to do with the way we are doing the experiment. Okay? I think it was actually confusing two numbers. I think that is much lower. I take it back. I take back my guess. <laughs> I think <laughs> I, I was confusing two measurements. You confuse two measurements. Yeah, so here I would assume it's actually probably TV scale, actually. I take back my... my really? Yeah. I got so excited. Yeah. Sorry, I was confusing uh, the... Can you still keep it with me for a sure. few more minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else wants to give another number? Do you remember those? Have you ever seen it? Have you, have some of you learn electronic precision measurement, ST parameters, the row parameters, ring the bell? Yes, those who read my book, you should have seen it, yes? Do you remember what are the bounds that you get from electronic precision measurement? 10 TV. 10 TV, thank you very much. Did you read my book? No, okay. So everybody who read my book didn't remember and the guy didn't read my book and he did. Okay. 10 to the 4 GV. Roughly. Right? That's from electronic precision. Electronic precision. Okay. So let me do, let me do something else. Let me go here. And erase this and do a nice table. Okay? So lambda is from electroweak precision. So that's basically testing the, the, the rho equal 1 relation, the fact that the mass of the w and the mass of the z are related to the g and the g prime. And the deviation from this, you calculate it at one loop, it's actually totally agree with one loop. And the experimental error and the theoretical error tells you that the dimension 6 operators is roughly 10 to the 10 TeV or 10 to the 4 GeV. Anybody knows what are the bounds that you get from proton decay? Anybody? Yes. So lambda is larger than 10 to the 16 GeV. That's from proton decay. Anybody know what the value that we get from flavor physics? You remember that I told you 
all those really cool numbers that I put from the PDG. And, it, and I said, at the end, the standard model, we didn't really get how exactly, explain all of those. And I will eventually get there and explain how it is done. What is the bound that I get from the fact that it's agree with the standard model? Hmm? <coughs> Actually, it's, a, it's, it's, lo it's more than that. From K sector, right? From K sector. Take the six plus five. Take hmm? the Ten to the six. So actually, from the best bounds come from CP violation in the K on sector, and it's about 10 to the eight GV, and that's from flavor. And the number like 100 TV come from B physics. Okay, so it depends what flavor, you know, it's very specific flavor, and in charm physics is different numbers. Anyway, but the best bounds come from epsilon K, with CP violation in K on physics, and it's about 10 to the 8 GV, okay? So now let's look a little bit of these numbers, and you kind of see something really cool about this number. 4, 8, 16, yes, it's, mm? Yes, I you like it? <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> yes? <coughs> but what I want to make is the following question. It's like, why we see this very different structure? Why, when we talk about proton decay, the bound is so much stronger compared to flavor, which is so much stronger compared to electroweak precision measurement. Okay? And the answer has to do with, again, what I was telling you, that the standard model is far from a generic theory. Okay? It's actually the fact that proton decay, there's a symmetry, an accidental symmetry, that protects it at dimension 4. And we can actually make very precise measurements, so we get a very, very good bound. Okay? Both electroweak and prot and flavor, there's no symmetry that guarantees that they are not there. They are, we already see it in nature, and, we s and these bounds come from the deviation from the standard model prediction. Okay? Here, these bounds come from the fact that we don't see the proton to decay. This one comes from the precision that we can make. So why flavor bounds are so much better than electroweak precision bound? Okay? <coughs> And that has to do with the fact that flavor physics, some of those parameters are extremely small in nature, and therefore they're also extremely small in the standard model because of this delicate thing that we talked about, okay? So this thing that I was telling you yesterday that the standard model is far from generic, what I want to make the point from these two numbers is that the flavor sector is much more delicate than the electroweak precision sector, okay? The, electro, the flavor sector, actually we get to much smaller number. We can probe much smaller effects using flavor physics than we do for electroweak. How do we measure in electroweak? Sorry? How do we measure in electroweak? So what we do it is actually you, <coughs> is the whole program of electroweak physics is you basically ma make very precise measure of the mass of the W, the mass of the Z, hadronic Z decay, leptonic Z decay, hadronic W decay, electroweak um, atomic parity violation, and you make a global fit basically to the to theta w g g prime these kind of things okay so you make like 20 30 measurements and you basically measure g and g prime and and the vev basically okay and you do a global fit and that's where you get this uh, deviation okay but the, the matching file operator is constrained mostly by electric, electric dipole moments right? so actually <coughs> The, <coughs> the electric dipole moment is, is the one that you usually talk about the theta QCD, and that's the way you get the bound from theta QCD. And you call it dimension 5 because it appears as a dipole operator. So it's effective dimension 5. We really didn't talk about dimension 5 in this sense, that this L5. This is the one that gives neutrino masses. And actually, if you just plug the neutrino masses that you measure, you find that the value of lambda is roughly 10 to the 16, 10 to the 14, 10 to the... You know, so it's roughly at this level, okay? So the dimension five, we kind of say, if that's what neutrino must give us, it's, it's, it's this kind, okay? But we don't know what lie up. We don't know what kind of heavy physics we have, if we have it all, and we don't know what come here. So if we want to uh, have the laser from top one, where do we put in flavor or in flavor? Sorry, in? Top one, because... So... <laughs> A lot of top physics come onto here, but also here. So, you know, it's not like a very precise <coughs> story. But so far, what we did until now, when we don't have too many tops, the, the, the separation was clear. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> Good. So now what I want to do, I want to get the little, yes. Are these bounds assuming minimal flare violation? So, no. So, these bounds assume... 
nothing. I just write my operators like this, and I ask what is here. So now what you can do, what you can do is you say, you know, I don't want to parameterize my dimension 6 operator like this. I can parameterize my dimension 6 operator, say, with some Yukawa here over lambda. And if this Yukawa, I can assume that this Yukawa is related to the standard model Yukawa, and it's very, very small. And then this number becomes also much smaller. Okay, so this is just a parameterization. And what I, all I wanted to make is the point that these two are different. And then you say, but if I actually multiply by the Yukawa, then these two become the same. Okay? So it, it, it's a little game. I just want to do, make the point, and I want you to remember those numbers. So what I want to do now, I want to become a little technical, and I want to actually go through the exercise of show you why those things that I was talking about, oop, how, this come, how those things come in the standard model, and how we actually calculate them and see what come in a standard model and which of them come in the standard model. Okay? <coughs> so, in order to do this, what I want to do, I want to actually calculate the coupling of the gauge boson, the W and the Z, into flavors, and we're going to see what we you already know how they couple, and once we understand how they couple, we understand why we have those kind of, uh, of structures, okay? And again, I assume that what I'm going to do now you've seen before, but still I want to go into a little bit of, uh, of a discussion, okay? So the first thing I want to say is that when I have my a doublet, so this one is a doublet, and I have three of them, this index i tell me that I have three of them, before spontaneous symmetry breaking, the two components of the doublet are identical. That's the meaning of being a doublet and we have a symmetry. When I have spontaneous symmetry breaking, I can separate, I can distinguish within the, the two components, okay? And therefore, I can call them different names, okay? I can call them U, L, and D, L. And for a change, this has some meaning. U is for up and D is for down, because U is the up component and D is the down component, okay? And <coughs> then those are the fields that I can start playing with them after spontaneous symmetry breaking, okay? So, <coughs> let's see <coughs> what we have to do. So what we have to do, and that's the procedure that we are doing, we write our Lagrangian, we have spontaneous symmetry breaking, and then we want to write our, the same Lagrangian, we want to write it in the mass basis. It's nothing but a, a basis change. But why we like to write everything in the mass basis? Actually, not everything, but all of you guys that talk about neutrinos. Yeah, not neutrinos. But up to neutrinos, why we want everything to be written in the mass eigenbasis? Because they are the propagating state, and when you do measurements, you measure things in the mass eigenstate, okay? But it's a basis choice. You don't have to do it. It's just a smart choice to do. Okay, so I want to do everything in the mass eigenbasis, and then we say, oh, that's actually very, that very easy to relate to experiment, because that's what experiments are measuring. Okay, so let's just say <coughs> that I have this kind of um, interaction. Let's say I have something like uh, d right, d slash, d right bar, so many d's. This d is the covariant derivative, and this d is the field. It's probably the worst example I could think about. And this i goes from 1 to 3, okay? And one very important thing is this, the number in front of it is always 1. That's called canonically normalized field, okay? And so it's the same number. And then when I'm actually uh, <coughs> moved to the mass eigenbasis, I have to take this. This is in some arbitrary basis. And when I find the mass basis, I move this into the mass basis. That's what I'm going to do, and then I'm going to see what comes out. Okay? So now let's see how I do basis, basis rotation. And again, I'm sure that you've seen it before, but let me do it, do it <coughs> for make clear that we are on the same, uh, <coughs> on the same <coughs> page on this. Okay? So let's write the Yuka Yukawa interaction. Let's say that I have some phi yij Q bar left i, d right j. That's the 
Yukawa interaction of the down type quarks, okay? After spontaneous symmetry breaking, this phi become the VEV, and it's have the VEV in the down component. It's a basis choice. We choose the VEV to be in the down component. Since the VEV is in the down component, I pick up only the down component from here, and then from here, I get the mass term for the <coughs> down type quarks, which is something like V, there's some square root of 2 that I don't write, V, Yij, D left bar I, D right J. Okay? And that's one, I can also call it Mij. Okay? Good, I assumed you've seen it before. And now come the cool part. Now I want to uh, find the mass basis. So how do I find the mass, ba the mass basis? I do the following things. I write it like this. I write D I bar, and then I write M I J, and then I write D write J, okay? And as you can tell, I left some, bla some space into here for a reason, okay? And the reason that I left this uh, space is, is because I want to multiply by one. And that's actually an extremely important tool that we have as physicists, that if you have some expression, you can multiply by one and nothing happened. Okay, so let's multiply it by one. Okay, very nice, nothing happened. And now come really cool things. And <coughs> there's many ways to write one. Okay, so one way to write, so one, what I mean here, one is a unitary metric, is a unit matrix. Okay, it's a unit matrix. How would you write one? Anybody have a cool way to write one? You know, Feynman wrote it as an integral of ta ta ta. You remember? He used the same trick. How would you write one here? With gamma matrices? No, no. There's also a very cool way to write one with gamma. But here, what, what would we, we? With unitary matrices. So how, how about use this? V, dagger V. How do you like it? So now let's write two, two ones. Let's write one from the left and one from the right. Okay? Why not? Yes, because we like to do. So let's take this one and write it as V left, dagger V left, and let's take this one and write it as V right, dagger V right. I did nothing, right? So far I did nothing. Okay? So let me keep doing nothing and take this part and now I want to choose my v left and v right. I can choose whatever I like, okay? As long as v left and v right are unitary matrices, I can choose them whatever I like. And now come this uh, statement that again I'm sure you heard before that a generic matrix, any generic matrix can be diagonalized by two <coughs> different unitary matrix, one from the left and one from the right. By the way, in what case this v left is equal to v right, what has to be m symmetric? more the symmetric works, but the general statement is Hermitian. That's why when you study quantum mechanics, you always have V left, V left, we all have a V, V dagger. Because in quantum mechanics, all your matrices are Hermitian. Okay? But since this M is not Hermitian, in general it's not Hermitian, this VL and V right are in general different matrices. But there exist, okay, that's a mathematical statement, that there exist a VL and V right, such that this combination, VL, MIJ, V right is Diagonal. Okay? So what I do here, I choose this combination to be diagonal. So that's actually specify the V left and the V right that I want to use. Okay? And then this one, this combination, I call the mass basis. And this combination, I call the mass basis for the right-handed field. Okay? And now since it's diagonal, this index I and this index J, can be the same because it's, it's diagonal, okay? So that's how I diagonalize my system. I did nothing but a basis choice, okay? And that's very important how you do diagonalization, is always remember that you do nothing. You multiply by ones, you move things up, but you don't change anything, and that's <coughs> kind of very useful, okay? So I actually did nothing, and I diagonalized <coughs> my system, okay? So now what I need to do, I just need to do the same story when I <coughs> multiply, when I add it to the kinetic term, okay? So let's add it to the kinetic term. Let me, let me 
<coughs> take this. And let's do the same story when I do with the kinetic terms. So now I take this and I add the one in the middle. So when I add the one in the middle, I have something like d bar i right v dagger v d bar. And there's some d slash. This is such a bad notch. Do, can you distinguish all the d's that when I write them, they look like, oh, it's hope it. OK, d uh, i. Yes, so you see that I did nothing. I just insert an i in the middle. And then I say this one is my mass eigenstate. And this one is my mass eigenstate. And you see that basically nothing happened. OK, do you see that nothing happened? Because I just rotate this and rotate this, and nothing happened. OK? In particular, I have to be a little careful of what's happened here in this D. And this D, for the D field, what gauge fields it's involved? It's involved the gluon and the photon, or if you like, the, the B field, OK? And the photon, right? Because it has electric charge. So both the gluon and the photon are there, but again, nothing happened because it's just a <coughs> trivial rotation that I'm doing. You with me on this? Not really. Some of you. There's two people who know, three. Um, any questions so I can get back on track? <coughs> mm -hmm. So the gauge fields, they, they don't carry flavor indices. So these Vs work in flavor space. They only work in this, on this index I. OK? So this. Yeah, you know, it's just some number that uh, appears in front of, of this, OK? And since this number is it, 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 the same number in front of everything, nothing happened when I apply this rotation. It basically takes the unit matrix and multiply the unit matrix by a unitary matrix, and nothing happened, OK? So now let me ask you the following question. What's happen if instead? Which D? Sorry. There's so many Ds, it's so bad. Uh, hmm? Ah, the V. <laughs> yeah, there's actually a Z. Totally right. I forgot. I no, 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 no. It's totally, you're totally right. I, I, I made a mistake. There's also a Z, of course. OK? So now, let me ask you the following questions. OK? Here, it was crucial that the value in front of all of these is the same. Okay, and in particular, when I write the covariant derivative, when I write the thing that when I, I expand the d mu, I should have write it before. Uh, so d mu is d mu plus i g. What the time? What the time? Five, hmm? Five more minutes. Okay, so let me just make this point and I'll be done. Okay, <clears throat> so I have something like g s the gluon field plus something, some number times the z plus some number times the a, right? So these are the coupling constant that involve the coupling to the z and the coupling to the a, OK? And now, in this case, the reason that everything went so smoothly is because these numbers that appear here are the same for everything. So I can take all of those numbers, put them out in front, and then when I do the rotation using these matrix things, nothing happened. And now I'm asking the following question. What would happen if this number would be different. What happens if the number in front here would be different depending on, the, on your flavor? Let me write it very explicitly. What happens if my matrix that I multiply will not be just 1, 1? So let's say that I have two particles, two fields, that have a different coupling to the Z boson, OK? So the, the matrix will be something like this. Here I will have 2, 0, 0, and 1. OK? That will be the coupling of, in front of the Z. What would happen now if I multiply it by V left? dagger and v left, or just v. What would happen now? Is this matrix will be diagonal? It would be? Mixing. Mixing. If it will be like this, if it's like this, it is? It will be diagonal, OK? So the point that I try to make is as following. The reason that when I actually make a rotation into the mass basis and nothing happened, is only when the coupling are the same, OK? If the coupling were not the same and I do the rotation, I get something that is not a universal and diagonal after the rotation. Is this point clear? OK, so now we look at the standard model and we say, wow, that's really cool. Because the coupling of the gluon, the photon, and the z are all 
universal. So they are proportional to the unit matrix. And when I rotate, they actually stay universal. And therefore, the coupling of the Z is also diagonal and universal in the mass basis. OK? So what we did is the following. Before I moved to the mass basis, everything was universal. And when I moved to the mass basis, everything is still universal. OK? But I want you to appreciate the fact that this is very, very specific to the fact that the coupling is the same. And in general, the coupling should not be the same. In a generic field theory, the coupling of the Z does not, doesn't have to be the same for all of my particles. Okay? So when I have mixing, I must have mixing with, if I, if I mix two particles which have the same electric charge, they must have the same electric charge because electromagnetism is a good symmetry. So I cannot mix an electron and a neutrino because they have different electric charge. I cannot have a mass eigenstate that doesn't have a well-defined electric charge. But I can actually do the same thing for the coupling of the Z. I can, I can couple things that have different coupling to the Z and they can still mix. Because the Z corresponds to a broken symmetry. It's not correspond to the unbroken symmetry. You with me? Not really. Ah. Almost to, almost to the end, and then I lost most of you. So time is up. Probably it's a good time for me to actually restart this last thing because I, I, I feel I'm, I'm lost. I'm, I am losing you. So what I want to do uh, tomorrow in the first lecture, I want to start from this point, and hopefully I will be able to explain a little bit more precise when we hit something that he, when the coupling is universal and when it's not, and how it is so crucial to our understanding of flavor physics. So let me stop here, and I we will continue from this point tomorrow. Okay. <coughs> I think we have time now for maybe like ten minutes of questions. But the, our microphones that they requested that we use. Oh. But you, it, it has to be very formal now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ask the question, I'll repeat it. Okay. Uh, does this universality have to do something with the, the quantization of the, of the, of the couplings? Does this uh, <laughs> you know, have to do with the, the quantity of the charges? No, no. So. What I want to do, and again, I, I felt that I, I kind of messed at, at, the, at the very end. And I, I hope that tomorrow I will be able to explain it better, OK? But this has nothing to do with the different question. The different question is why the electric charge looks quantized. Yes, and, and this is an interesting question in the following sense, that if you look at the masses of the particles, those masses are all over the place. There's no relation between them. And when you look at the electric charge, the electric charge are very nicely done. You know, it's like 0, 3, 2, 3, 1. Now, theoretically, they come from a fundamentally different point. The electric charge comes from, uh, <coughs> from the input that we come as an input to model building, and the Yukawa are a measurement that we do. So they are fundamentally different. But still, we ask why it is that one of them we choose to be kind of nicely multiply of a third of the, of the charge of the electron, and the other is all over the place. Okay? And that's the question of what we call charge quantization. Okay? And the several idea that maybe it's hinting to something deeper. And my prejudice, or the one that I feel is kind of cool and nice, is that it could come from a, if, you t if a U1 is an unbroken U1 of a, a non-abelian symmetry, then the, the charges must be quantized. Okay, so if you take an SO3, and I look at rotation in the plane in SO3, I still have quantization of, uh, those, of the electric charge. Okay? But I'm not going to get there. There's nothing to do. That's not what I was aiming at. Yes? So do we get universality just because um, your representations are flavor independent? So do we get universality just because our, rep our representation are flavor independent? The answer is yes, but I just want to say it a little differently. We get universality basically because all our fermions have the same gauge representation. We call it sequential generations, OK? The fact that we built the standard model in a way that we take one generation and totally multiply it, OK? And as I said, it's a very specific choice. We could make a different choice. 
we can make a choice that one generation is like what we have, and the other generation we put both the left and the right hand component into a singlet of SU2. Okay? And it will be a totally normal model and it could explain a lot of things. But it will not give us lepton universality. Okay? So that's what I'm aiming at. Okay? So it's actually the very specifics of the standard model that we have gener uh, generation. It's, a, it's very important that are sequential generation. Yes? Yes. Um, no, it's not easy to see, uh, but there's actually a formal way to see how many generators you have that are unbroken. Okay, you actually take the generation, apply it on the vacuum, and see what is broken. So in this sense, I'm just telling you, but if you want to do the exercise, you can actually do it. Okay, it's not something that, oh, it's come out of the blue. Okay, so you actually take it, multiply it by the vacuum, and see how many you have. So you can actually check how many broken generators you have you know, in a, in a technical way. So, for the leptonic sector, actually, uh, there are three because you, uh, in the end, we do not observe lep lepton flavor violation, right? So, it's the U1, LE, U1, LMU, U1, LTEL, was unbroken. So, the question is, how do we know that we have U1 cubed in the lepton sector? And the philosophy that I'm going through here is that I start for model building and then I take my model and compare it to experiment, okay? Historically, of course, it was the other way around. You take your experimental data and then you build your model that to fit the experimental data. And historically, we, didn't see, we did not see lepton number violation, so we are very happy to have a model that predicts no lepton number violation. Moreover, historically, and still <coughs> most of the time, the neutrino seems to be consistent with being massless, so we actually wanted the model that make neutrino to be massless, okay? And once the neutrino are massless, you end up with having a U1 cubed symmetry, okay? And now, if we add the dimension 5 operator, let's break this U1, and it's give neutrino mass, and it's break all the flavor symmetries. And we actually see it in neutrino oscillation experiment, we see lepton number violation. We see a, a muon become an electron. Coffee. <laughs> see you tomorrow.